Good evening, everybody. It sounds like you're excited to be here. Well, we are glad that you are here. My name is Jim Stump. I'm the vice president at BioLogos, the science and faith organization that was founded by Francis Collins, whom you all showed up to hear tonight. First, a less exciting opening act. I'll be brief. Tonight's the culmination of a series of talks sponsored by the Trinity Forum in partnership with Church of the Advent and with BioLogos. We titled the series Discovery and Doxology. It's included the discussion of some amazing scientific discoveries from the incomprehensibly vast to the unbelievably tiny. We've gone from the multiverse down to genetics, from computers to our own brains. What science has discovered in the last generation has simply been wonderful in the most literal sense of that word. I'm here pinch hitting for Biologus President Deb Harzma. She came down with COVID last week. She's feeling better now, but still in the window where she shouldn't travel. Deb is an astronomer by training, and if she were here, to talk about discovery, she'd definitely be talking about these James Webb telescope photographs. These are wonderful and should move us to the second term in this series, doxology. It was G.K. Chesterton who said, the worst moment for an atheist is when he's really thankful and has no one to thank. <laughs> in the same way, when we Christians are filled with wonder from things like these amazing scientific discoveries, we believe there's someone there who's responsible for creating them and who gladly receives our praise and our thanks, our doxology. So I'm a philosopher by training, and I'm afraid my discipline too often does a better job of inspiring skepticism than doxology. I see those web telescope pictures, and I too am amazed, but then my next thought is, hmm, I wonder how they put those together. It's not like there's just a camera at the end of a telescope that they snap a picture, right? It's not even visible light. How are we seeing this? Well, if you're interested in hearing how an actual scientist responds to such pesky questions, I'll be interviewing Deb Harzma for the Biologos podcast in a couple of weeks about the web telescope pictures. Too often, it's science and scientists who are blamed for pushing people away from God. But this series shows that it can be the opposite, suggesting that the knowledge we've gained through science can draw us closer to God. We don't think science itself can answer our deepest questions about God and meaning and truth and beauty and goodness, but often it can point us toward them. And when viewed rightly, science and Christian faith can offer complementary and even harmonious perspectives that are richer and more satisfying than either of them on their own. When the pandemic came upon us a couple of years ago, there were some of us who thought it might actually be an opportunity for people of faith to more wholeheartedly get behind science. We hoped, even prayed, that the scientists working on vaccines would be successful. Deb herself was in one of the clinical trials. She found out later she got a placebo, but then later, of course, was uh, vaccinated and boosted, and almost certainly that, and the Paxlovid helped her have a uh, mild case when she contracted the virus this week, and has been thankful that she was able to contribute to the scientific response to COVID in that little way. But hers was not the typical response from American Christians to science around COVID. Our speaker tonight knows probably better than anyone that rather than healing the rift between science and faith in the general population, the pandemic exacerbated the perception that these are on different sides. But they don't have to be. With that, I'm pushing further into the content of tonight's program than I was commissioned to do. So let me end by saying, on behalf of BioLogos, that it has been a pleasure to partner with our hosts here at the Trinity Forum. 
please welcome the president of the Trinity Forum and tonight's moderator, Cherie Harder. Well, thank you, Jim, for that very kind and thoughtful introduction. And welcome to all of you to tonight's evening conversation on science, faith, trust, and truth. It is so fun to be back in person and get to see so many of you again. As Jim was saying, tonight is actually the capstone event to what has been a multi-event series over a number of years that Trinity Forum, BioLogos, and Church of the Advent have partnered on, on this broad theme of science and faith, discovery and doxology. And as Jim hinted at, we've covered all sorts of topics. We've talked about understanding transhumanism with Rosalind Picard and Rich Mao, neurobiology and the soul, suffering, healing, and meaning with Julia Watashiro and Phil Yancey, faith and empiricism with Art Louie and Tremper Longman, and we could think of no better capstone uh, for this long series than our speaker tonight. But we are so grateful to have been able to partner uh, with BioLogos, ably led by Deb Harzma and Jim Stump, uh, as well as Church of the Advent, uh, led by Rector Tommy Henson. I know that we have some, some guests from Church of the Advent, including Deb Tepley, Jeff Simpson, Jeff Bailey, and Lauren Porter, and others from Church of the Advent here tonight, so thank you. Uh, in addition to that, I want to acknowledge a few special guests of the Trinity Forum, including the chairman of our board, Richard Miles, who's here tonight with his wife, Phoebe, our senior fellows, Michael Ware, and new residential senior fellow, Pete Wainer, uh, brand new communications director, Brian Daskin, who just started a week or two ago. Brian, maybe you can wave your hand so people can see you. And if you'll permit me one small indulgence, I'd also love to give a shout out to my husband, Chris Spiegelmeyer, who is spending his birthday here tonight. So, <laughs> uh, But we're glad that each and every one of you are here tonight for this sold out event. Part of our mission at the Trinity Forum is to provide a space and resources for the discussion of life's greatest and thorniest questions in the context of faith, and to offer programs like this evening conversation to do that and to come to better know the author of the answers. And the topic we're tackling tonight certainly qualifies as one of those great and thorny questions. It's fair to say that we live in confusing even confounding times, between being awash in often conflicting data, surrounded by spin, pummeled with misinformation, and addled by an outrage industry, it can be difficult to know what to believe or whom to trust. Our technologies and media, rather than helping us sift through a lot of the conflicting data, has instead brought confusion to scale and harden the divides along partisan lines. Increasingly, we are riven not so much just among lines of values, what's right or wrong, but increasingly over what's true or false, or even real or unreal. The fallout has not only been toxic for the body politics, as public debate has been distorted by conspiracies and common spaces are increasingly co-opted as battlegrounds for an ever-expanding culture war. But just in the last two years has literally been lethal for hundreds of thousands of people who were falsely led to believe that the pandemic was a hoax or that vaccines were a plot. So how, in the midst of so much division, distraction, and discord, do we apprehend what is real and reliable? What or whom should we trust? If living wisely requires rightly discerning reality, how do we learn to seek what is true? And what do both the methodologies of science and the substance of our faith have to say about discernment, discovery, and wonder? For our speaker tonight, these questions have been ones of not only enormous spiritual and religious significance, but also of urgent public health importance. It's a great honor to introduce a man of science and faith who has wrestled with these questions with both extraordinary expertise and energy, gravitas and grace under pressure, Dr. Francis Collins. 
Dr. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> Dr. Collins is one of the world's leading scientific, uh, scientists and geneticists and was the longest serving director of the NIH in our nation's history. Before being appointed by then President Obama to serve as the head of the NIH, a role then extended by President Trump, he led the International Human Genome Project, which mapped the entire human genome and did so under time and under budget. <laughs> His work with the Human Genome Project, which in essence provided a human DNA instruction book, led to the discovery of the connection between certain uh, genes and various diseases and helped to revolutionize our understanding of our genetic makeup. He's been elected to the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, is the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the National Medal of Sciences, and the Templeton Prize for Advancing Scientific Understanding of the Deep Questions of the Universe. He was also appointed by Pope Benedict to the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences. Before becoming the head of the NIH, Francis founded and served, as uh, Jim mentioned, as the president of the Biologos Institute and Foundation, our partners tonight, and has written a number of books on science, medicine, and religion, including the New York Times bestseller, The Language of God. He is also an avid motorcyclist, guitarist, and vocalist who has played in rock bands and performed at TED conferences. And we're delighted that not only is he here, but also his wife, Diane Baker, and his grandson, Sellers Hill, have joined us for the evening as well. After Francis's prepared remarks, he and I will have a brief moderated conversation, followed by a time of Q&A from the audience. Francis, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Cherie, for an incredibly gracious introduction, and I'm delighted to be here this evening in this event sponsored by Trinity Forum and BioLogos with this intriguing title, which you've just heard about uh, from Jim, Discovery and Doxology. Uh, Diane and I came from a previous episode of a gathering on a rooftop for a reception just before this, which is why I have taken off my tie, and I would encourage others who would like to do so uh, to do the same on this uh, warm summer evening. But it, we're in a wonderful place here in the National Press Club, and I want to give my personal thanks to Cherie for her leadership of the Trinity Forum, which has been such a source of wise and thoughtful input to many of us who are trying to understand the role of faith in our complicated modern world. And through their readings and meetings like this, we are always uplifted. We're asked to think a little more deeply about something than we have before. And I hope this evening will play some kind of a role like that, mostly because of your questions and Cherie's questions, but maybe a little bit because of what I hope to share with you. Yes, the topic, Science, faith, trust, and truth brings together four nouns in a place where they may not necessarily at the present time be getting along very well. And yet all of those are nouns that I think for this audience are considered to be really important and really have the potential of making some kind of wonderful conversation and collaboration between each other to lift us to a better place. But in our current circumstance, especially in this country, we're in a situation where science and faith don't always seem to be speaking effectively to each other. And trust and truth are also, I think, from my perspective, in a particularly difficult place. I'm gonna pose some questions. I won't necessarily have a lot of answers about how we find ourselves out of this situation, but I hope you will agree with me that we need to find those answers. Uh, we are in a very difficult and troubling space uh, with the divisiveness that has found its way into almost all of our discourse and where people of faith, unfortunately, having the chance perhaps to chart a path forward, have often been caught up instead in other kinds of messages coming from politics or social media that may in many instances be antithetical to the foundations of their own beliefs and yet have been very compelling. And we've been driven so much 
by fear and anger that we, in many instances, have forgotten about what it is that the truth can do, which is to set you free. So that all sounds a little troubling and maybe even a little dark. I don't mean it to sound that way, but I do think we're in a serious situation, and it's up to all of us to try to figure out what we can do individually to find a path forward that honors both science and faith. A little background on myself. This is not a presentation where I intend to give you my own testimony of how, as an atheist, I came to be a follower of Jesus. But that is, in fact, my story. I was an atheist in graduate school studying quantum mechanics. I went to medical school and discovered that questions of life and death were not just theoretical and hypothetical. They were happening around me every day, watching good people who had done nothing to deserve it, afflicted by terrible illnesses, and recognizing that I had no answers for those questions, and particularly the question posed to me by one of my own patients, doctor, what do you believe? And I realized I didn't have an answer to that. And in the course of a couple of years, guided by a lot of wise people who were willing to listen to my questions and guide me in various directions to read about the works of others who had traveled that same path, particularly C.S. Lewis, I came at age 27 to recognize that atheism was the least rational of the choices, the assertion of a universal negative, as Chesterton has said. And in fact, belief was not only rational, it was actually pointed to by a variety of things from science, like the Big Bang, like the fine tuning of the universe, like how mathematics explains the behavior of matter and energy in ways that are actually beautiful and inspiring and force you to a direction of trying to understand what intellectual brain must have been behind the way in which our universe came into being. And I also came to realize my own failings as a person who was supposed to have a moral character and a need to find a way that that could be, in fact, resolved. And for me, <clears throat> that solution came in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I show this picture as a way in which I try to put forward in a very brief visual image how it is that people like myself who are both scientists and people of faith see those as different ways of understanding truth. On the left there, this beautiful image of a stained glass window. This happens to be York Minster, but if you go to the National Cathedral, you'll see one much like this. And on the right, that's DNA. Not in the usual vision where you look at it from the side, but looking down the barrel of the long axis of the double helix, a remarkably beautiful and maybe a little bit reminiscent image. I'm not trying to say that I'm taking that too far, but it is beautiful. And in fact, science is a way I have learned of appreciating the beauty of God's creation, that every discovery we make in the laboratory it does not reduce your awe at what God has given us. It increases that awe, and especially so, it gives you a sense of beauty. And so coming to faith as a 27-year-old who was already interested in genetics and being warned by many people that my head was going to explode because there would be immediate controversies and conflicts between the scientific and spiritual worldviews. I'm happy to say it didn't happen. <laughs> and this is uh, more than four decades later. And I've yet to encounter a circumstance where what, is I know, what I know as a scientist about the universe, about nature, is actually in conflict with what I know as a Christian believer who reads the Bible with great intensity to understand its meaning, but needs to be careful not to attach to it meanings that weren't intended by the original writers. So there we are. And there I was, had the privilege of leading the Human Genome Project, reading out those three billion letters of our instruction book, an amazing crossing of a bridge into new territory which we don't have to cross back again. We have that information, and it is changing medicine every day in terms of how we approach a multitude of issues, maybe especially cancer and also genetic diseases, especially those that we had not understood before and maybe even coming up for cures for things like sickle cell disease. But then as the director of the National Institutes of Health being asked to focus on a whole host of complicated issues in biomedical research. Maybe it's the brain, maybe it's trying to understand regenerative medicine or precision medicine. And then, a little over two years ago, the realization that something really threatening was happening to our planet. You will know 
Oh, sorry, I should not pass by on that. I should have said that, in fact, when it comes to this argument about how we are, in fact, capable of being both scientists and believers, I often look back to these words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 22, being asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And I think most of us remember, well, it's to love the Lord your God. But what is the rest of it? With all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Your mind, that's part of how you love the Lord, with your mind. If you go back to Deuteronomy, which is where this quote seemed to come from, it's about with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength. But Jesus said, with all your mind. I think we were supposed to notice that. Well, then we came to January of 2020 and to these immediately worrisome headlines in Science Magazine, in the Washington Post, that something's going on in Wuhan, China. And it did not take long before it became clear that this was a virus that had the capacity of spreading rapidly. In fact, it had already spread to our country before most people had realized that fact. And as you know, here we are now, in the summer of 2022, after two and a half years uh, of a devastating set of outcomes with the deaths of more than a million people in the United States alone and many more in the rest of the world. My role as the NIH director was to try to see what we could do in every possible way to bring together the best and brightest scientists, regardless of whether they were academics or industry or government, and sit around the same table and put together a plan to come up with strategies that would develop preventions with vaccines, treatments with various drugs, better diagnostics, and that's what we did. And people worked 100 hours a week, me included, uh, for week after week after week, recognizing that every day that went by that you wasted time was putting lives at risk. And particularly with the vaccines, uh, we needed to do everything we could uh, to pull together the things that NIH had to offer here, which were in the area of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines, but particularly for vaccines to come up with a way in which we could use new tools, including something called messenger RNA, in a rapid fashion uh, to try to develop something that would protect people against the worst outcome of COVID-19. And there were six of these different vaccines that were worked on collectively between government, academia, and industry. You'll see the names of the companies. We got all very tightly connected with each other. And you will see that, of course, in the top row here, two of those, Moderna's mRNA vaccine and Pfizer-BioNTech's mRNA vaccine, we're really tackling this in a brand new way that had never been done this way before for a human illness, but had the promise of going even faster because you could design the vaccine in record time. The Moderna vaccine was effectively designed at NIH in our vaccine research center in 48 hours after we knew the sequence of that virus. And it was in a human clinical trial, a phase one trial in 63 days, which is like five or 10 times faster than had ever been done before. And it was in a phase three trial for 30,000 participants by late July of 2020, also unprecedented. And then we held our breath. You know, the way these trials are run, they have to be done in what's called a double-blind, randomized, controlled way. So if you're a participant in this, as Deb Harsma was, you sign up to say, I would like to take part in this trial. And you don't know whether you're going to get the active agent, in this case the vaccine, or a dummy placebo, which is still something that looks like a shot in your arm. But it's actually not going to give you any particular effect. And then you watch and see what happens to those 30,000 people. And it had to be a lot in order to have appropriate power to know whether it worked and whether it was safe. And you collect the data, but you don't unblind the data until the last minute. So nobody knows. You start to see people in the trial got COVID. Well, did they get the vaccine or did they get the dummy? You don't know until that day when the data is unblinded. And we all held our breath about that. I thought, you know, if it was 60% effective, that would still be pretty good. That would be a good year for the flu vaccine, by the way, which is often not even quite as effective as that because it's really hard. Maybe 65. And there was that November night uh, where the data was unblinded, and we all held our breath. And then the result was released, 95% for both of those vaccines. 
I had prayed so hard about this. And yet I had also counted on science to be the answer to the prayers. And in that moment, it seemed like it all came true. And I'll be honest, I cried like a baby that night. Tears of joy, tears of relief. We had an answer. We now have a way of saving the lives that haven't yet been taken by this, and plenty had been. And maybe we will be able to see a path forward where we can get through this. And so I signed up, and I got my first shot. And I assume because you all are here and you had to show your evidence that you did too. <laughs> and I got my second shot, and I assume you did that too. And I hope you all got your boosters because uh, the evidence is very strong that this is a wily virus that keeps changing its coat. And while you might have had great immunity to the original virus when Delta and now Omicron and now BA5 uh, come along, the additional needs that you have to keep boosting, and there'll be another need for boosters this fall uh, against BA5, and you will have an opportunity to take advantage of that. That is simply the nature of what we've learned through science about what's needed. But again, those pictures you see, those were in the first phase of getting these vaccines out there, and I thought, we're gonna be okay. But then look what happened to vaccine doses administered in the U.S. Off to a great start there in January of 2021. And by April or May, pretty much anybody who wanted a vaccine could get one for free with lots of ways that this was set up to make it easy. But look what happened. It started dropping off. And by July, we're kind of down uh, to a much lower level. And it hasn't really picked up that much since that time. That was a surprise at this level because that means even today some 50 million people have yet to take advantage of what from every bit of scientific evidence is an effective way to prevent the worst outcomes of this disease. Is it completely safe? In those 30,000 patients that were involved in the trials, there was no indication of a safety problem. Once you get to millions and millions of people, yes, there are rare instances where the vaccine can cause things like myocarditis or a blood clotting problem. But if you add up the risks of benefit versus the risk of harm, it's not even close. And yet a lot of people decided not to do so. Let me tell you about one. Uh, that's Josh Tidmore and his wife, Christina. Uh, they were living in Alabama. This was the summer of 2021. They knew the vaccines were out there, but they were hearing things, reading things on social media, hearing things in their church, which had been founded by Josh's grandfather, that maybe this wasn't to be trusted, that maybe this was actually something that everybody was in cahoots with the drug companies to make money and these vaccines didn't really work or maybe they were a lot more dangerous than anybody would admit. And there was this guy Fauci and nobody was quite sure what to make of him. And so Josh <laughs> and Christina decided they weren't gonna get vaccinated. And then a month later, they both got sick. And Christina got better pretty quickly. Josh, just 36 year old, year old and otherwise healthy, didn't seem to be recovering, got worse, ended up hospitalized, ended up in the ICU. This is his last day. Josh died four days before his 37th birthday. His wife, Christina, heartbroken by this with their two little kids now to care for, recognized that they had been given information that really wasn't accurate about the vaccines and they had passed up something that they probably would have wanted to take advantage of and became very public about her concerns about the misinformation on local media, talking to people in her church, and she was attacked for that. People in her church telling her, don't you realize that there is no such thing as COVID? Your husband died of something else. Don't fall into the trap of being manipulated by all those government people. And eventually she fell silent, it was just too hard. How could this have happened? These are good, God-loving, hard-working people who had been brought into a place that actually took Josh's life. Many of us tried what we could do at that point to try to get the word out. Credit to BioLogos. Oh, sorry, I'm skipping over something important here. Uh, this, this is uh, an estimate of what exactly uh, seems to be the place where vaccine resistance is most striking. 
And if you can see close enough, and I realize some people in the back can't, it's basically saying, what is the likelihood of being unvaccinated based on your particular demographic? And so the green bars are those not vaccinated, and the group that is highest on the list, highest of all the people in the United States, are white evangelicals. Lowest on the list are the atheists. Go figure. <laughs> so yeah, how, how did this happen to God's people? <laughs> I'm a white evangelical. <laughs> those are my people. <laughs> Well, okay, you can begin to pinpoint some of the areas that led to this. There is certainly a long-standing undercurrent of distrust of science and scientists. That's what BioLogos has been wrestling with in the experience of the last decade or more. And some of that is based upon questions about origins and the unnecessary conflict that is still embraced by many people about whether the Earth is actually uh, four point. Uh, 6 billion years old or whether it is 6,000 years old. And so much of that undercurrent has led to a sense that maybe scientists have an agenda, uh, that scientists are atheists. Well, actually 40% of us are believers in a personal God. Whether scientists are elitist, kind of talking down to you. And to be honest, okay, let me look in the mirror. Some of our messages have been conflicting and not easily understood. And when we had to change the messages because the science changed, it sounded like flip-flopping instead of like, okay, there's new information here. We fouled up, up the communication part of this on numerous instances. But on top of that, we had political messages overtaking the truth and also overtaking faith principles in a way that were pretty hard to understand. Some would say, and I guess I have to agree, that maybe it showed a certain vulnerability in our own Christian training about what are the principles of our faith, what you might call spiritual formation and catechism, that you could, in fact, bring on board messages that sounded like fear and anger in the face of Jesus' words, which would have counseled in a very different direction, and that somehow those things seem to fit together in, in church communities. And, of course... The way in which the information oftentimes spun forward uh, for reasons that had nothing to do with either faith or truth uh, filled up people's eyes and ears. And cable news, of course, <laughs> winning the battle for attention over whatever was happening on Sunday morning by a more than tenfold access uh, to people's attention. Social media, making this worse, spreading anger, lies preferentially oftentimes over love and truth with really no way to control that. Uh, certainly information that makes people angry, we all understand, spreads 10 times faster than information that's actually going to calm you down. And then on top of that, our nation's affliction now of tribalism, divisiveness, and frankly, vitriol, overtaking what should have been our better angels. People of faith should have been out in front saying, wait, stop, let's look at this. Let's figure out what's really true and who we should trust. And let's lean on our principles that the truth will set you free to figure out what we should do. And all too often, that was drowned out. Oh, yes, and then there are the very real casualties of all this. This is not just a hypothetical discussion about philosophy. Current estimates are 319,000 people are in graveyards unnecessarily because of the information about vaccines was not presented to them in a way that they believed could be helpful. 319,000 deaths. Just astounding. Now, many efforts were made to try to fix this misinformation. BioLogos got engaged with a number of things. It was a blog from Deb Harzma, Curtis Chang, a uh, pastor, uh, really trying to put out words there about how we could be sure that people of faith understood where a spiritual perspective might take you with wrestling with these issues about vaccines and masks and other things. Uh, Biologos putting forward a recommendation, <laughs> love your neighbor, get the shot, making the point that it's not just about you. It's about the people you're interacting with, some of whom are immunodeficient and who can't take the vaccine because it won't work for them. So it's up to you to try to be sure they don't get exposed. And I think that made some difference, but I don't know that I would say it was a huge change in the way things are. Articles like this pointing out pushback to vaccines, stubbornly high amongst which group? White evangelicals. 
How did this happen? I got to say, I didn't see this coming. I'm the kind of guy that thought, you know, if you get the science right and you put the information in front of people and they'll look at it and they'll go, okay, that's what we need to do. And that was hopelessly naive. And it was naive before COVID, but it woke my eyes up to it by seeing this happen in this situation. See, I was a, a Cartesian. I kind of went along with Rene Descartes here. <laughs> that it's all rationality. I think, therefore, I am. Show me rational evidence, and I'll know what to do. David Hume had a different view. My friend David Brooks is fond of saying, in the Super Bowl of philosophy, David Hume absolutely knocked Rene Descartes out of the stadium. <laughs> look at yourself. Uh, look at ourselves in the mirror. Yeah, you'd like to think you're a rational actor, but reason, in many ways, is a slave of the passions. Maybe I like Pascal a little better here. Uh, of course, he said it in French. The heart has its reasons, which reason knows not of. Do you recognize that in yourself? <laughs> when information comes at you that you want to try to evaluate, do you really think you're completely objective in taking it on board? Or does your heart already have an opinion about what the answer ought to be? And if that new information is you know, synergistic with that, it's like, bring it on. And if it's not, like, I don't know about this source. So we're all there. I'm there. I am no longer able to claim this purest rational behavior, because I know it's not true of me either. <laughs> but it's certainly not true of our nation at this time. And others have written about this, and this is not a new revelation, really. Uh, if you want to read more details uh, from a very impressive social scientist who's dug through this, read Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, While Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Or read another Jonathan, Jonathan Rauch, The Constitution of Knowledge, talking about truth and how we need to defend it and how our minds, because of this cognitive bias, which is another way of saying we're not fully rational actors, uh, is constantly getting in the way. And you'll have to admit it's true. Now, what does faith say about this? I think faith says a lot about this. It puts out some warning signs, and that's true of the major religions of the world. Proverbs. Chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. A haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We're not seeing any of that now, are we, huh? Uh, the Quran, oh, you have faith. Be wary of Allah and be with the truthful. In the New Testament, already quoted, these are the words of Jesus. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You could figure out what lies would do. It's not the same. The Buddha, three things cannot be long hidden. The sun, the moon, and the truth. I want that to be true. <laughs> so what to do about this? I found myself in a quandary. I was interested in maybe even trying to write something about this, perhaps a book that I could write directly to my brothers and sisters of faith in the evangelical community. But I felt like maybe that's a little bit elitist to imagine that I know what their experience is like. And so right before I got asked to serve as the president science advisor, which is currently my job and has gotten a little bit in the way of book writing, I reached out to a group that I want you to know about. Oh, by the way, it's not just about truth, it's also about trust. Who do you trust? And that's a group called Braver Angels, founded about six years ago, intended to bring together what was already seen as an increasingly divisive uh, group of constituencies, people who really didn't want to talk to each other because they knew it would go badly and having them come together in a moderated setting where it was possible to have a civil discourse and to listen to each other, not just lecture, and also to see whether there are areas for common ground. 
Uh, better angel, braver angels have been around there, and they've had many discussions on many topics. And I signed up uh, to try to get a better handle on what the views were of people who had a very different perspective than mine about public health. And now I've probably spent 16 to 20 hours in various settings of this sort with panels uh, really wrestling with the different perspectives that are spread across our country, which you might put forward in the current terminology of reds versus blues. I am not either. I've never registered with a political party. I think of myself as nonpartisan, nonpolitical. But when it comes to truth, I'm pretty partisan about that. And so how do I understand this? And one of the people I've gotten to know is this guy. In fact, I've spent a lot of time with this guy. And this is Wilk Wilkinson. He runs a trucking company uh, in rural Minnesota. And he's part of the Braver Angels team and has spent a lot of his time on it. That's Wilk. And he very much represents everything I'm trying to understand and which I think I would have had a hard time really getting my head around without spending the time to see where he's coming from. Because he sees the government as the source of most of the problems in his life, the over-intrusiveness, the insistence on making changes uh, relating to COVID that have wrecked his economy, that have kept his kids home from school, which has been bad for their social development and bad for their mental health. And he sees the government as simply not understanding what his life is like and imposing all kinds of constraints on him that are not justified. And so we've talked to each other a lot about that, and I'm beginning to understand where he's coming from. And I will frankly say at this point, Wilk's my friend. Uh, I would feel comfortable having a beer with him, although it's all been done by Zoom. <laughs> and I think he would say the same. But we totally disagree on a wide variety of things. But it's a good thing to do that. And then I thought about how do I kind of put this together? Because while I think we totally disagree, somehow we do have this common ground of things that we all agree are important values. Is there a way to kind of pers uh, per present that in a fashion that I can get my head around and maybe could help other people also trying to sort this out? And trying to figure this out, I encountered a particular way of looking about beliefs from a philosopher that was pointed to me by none other than Jim Stump, who started our conversation, who's a philosopher. By the way, I am not a philosopher. I'm not a theologian. I'm mostly a scientist, but I'm a follower of Jesus, and I'm trying to find some way to put this all together. And Willard Van Orman Quine, a philosopher you may not have heard of, actually helped me, thanks to Jim, coming up with a visual metaphor of what it is that might make sense of why Wilk and I both, I think, as honest, sincere people, I hope so, have come up with very different views about what is true. And it's what you call the web of belief. So think about this. Oh, I've already gone too far here. Think about the web. That's your belief system. Well, in this case, it's going to be mine. And think about a spider web. It's got all these threads. If there is something that's really important to you in your web of belief, right there in the center of the web, you're going to do everything you can to protect that. You are not comfortable having that thread broken because the whole web is going to start to look unstable, and none of us want that to happen. Our web of belief is really important to our sense of stability and who we are. But some of the things on the outside that maybe are... You know, I kind of think that's true. If you come after me about that one and you show me some evidence, yeah, I might be willing to let that thread go. Think about that for yourself. What would you put in the middle and what things are out there on the side? So I'm going to be disclosing here about what I would put in various parts of this. And then last week I talked to Wilk and I said, Wilk, you got to do this exercise too. And so I'll show you what he did. But start with me. Science is trustworthy, <laughs> okay? <laughs> You're not surprised, right? That that's somewhere very much in the center of things. Other things I care about. My wife loves me. Diane, please tell me that that's okay, that I don't, don't have to revise that. That's pretty darn central to who I am and what I believe about everything around me. My cat loves me. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, Zoe, I think sometimes it looks that way. Other times you're like totally disinterested. So if somebody presented me evidence to the contrary, I'd probably not be totally destroyed. Jesus died for me. That is such a central part of who I am. That if you're going to try to argue against that, uh, if you're going to tell me the bones of Jesus have been found in a crypt uh, somewhere in Israel, I'm going to have a really hard bunch of questions to ask you about that. Because Jesus died for me and the resurrection is true. Those are central. On the other hand, when you get to some of these theological arguments, are you a premillennialist or a postmillennialist? I can argue that both ways. I'm not going to get too worked up if you try to tell me that premillennialism is not actually correct. Okay, let's get to science. Vaccines are safe and effective. Yes, but you notice I didn't put that in the total center because I know vaccines can, in some rare instances, actually cause harm. So vaccines provide more benefit than risk. I would say that one, but safe and effective absolutely 100% of the time, the data wouldn't support that. Public health needs experts, yes. But here's something I've learned from Wilk. <laughs> Public health also needs community inputs. It's not just the experts. And we probably made a mistake in, in the best of intentions uh, by trying to make those decisions without listening enough. The CDC is always right. Well, <laughs> God bless them, they are trying. <laughs> working against imperfect data with state systems that do or do not really have to report their results, it's a tough system. And so CDC can't be expected to be always right, and they aren't. Mandating masks in school was essential. For a while I thought so, now I'm not quite so sure, so I'm gonna put that somewhere a little bit further out on the web. Okay, let's talk about climate change. Is it real? You bet it is. <sighs> Politics? Did Joe Biden win the 2020 election? <laughs> yeah, all well, the data I've seen pretty uncovertably says yes, he did. Structural racism is real. You know, at NIH as the director, sort of looking at this question, I had to admit, the legacy of 400 years of slavery was still with us. Uh, our own workforce will tell you that by whether or not people of color feel welcome in our environment. They don't always. And that is a reflection of the fact that the echoes are still there and structural racism is still with us. So that was kind of my web. Um, oh, was there one more there? Um, I think time to move on to Wilk. So yeah, uh, again, after all this, I thought, give him a chance. Now, Wilk is a little wordier than I am. <laughs> so some of his responses are not in three words, they're in 10 or 12. His number one, government's first and primary duty is to protect the individual from undue force and fraud, not run their lives. And he feels that passionately, and that's right near the center of his web. And he will tell you that in every conversation. And at first, I was put off by that, but now I get it. I get it. That's how he feels. That's been his experience. His wife loves him, too. <laughs> He believes he's instilling the correct values in his children, but he doesn't put that all the way at the center because he's not absolutely sure. <clears throat> he's also a very serious Christian who believes in the resurrection and who feels Jesus died for him. We have that in common. And he believes God created all things and is ultimately in control of all things, although we haven't really resolved where he is as far as origins and the age of the universe. Some vaccines are safe and effective. He will admit that. He got vaccinated himself, somewhat reluctantly, but mandates are unacceptable. Government intrusion into the medical relationship between physicians and patients has very damaging ramifications. Again, government, he sees, constantly jumping into a place where it doesn't belong. A government's response to the pandemic will go down as one of the most damaging mistakes in U.S. history given its social, economic, and mental health consequences. Now, you're probably wondering, how do you talk to this guy? You know, because I understand where he's coming from, because I've spent 10 or 12 hours with him, and I can see through the lenses that he has in front of him why this has been the truth of his circumstance. Manning masks was ineffective and inappropriate, especially of children. 
He does think climate change is real, but whether it's caused by man's activity is debatable, but destroying the economy to combat it is unacceptable. So we disagree profoundly on whether it's real and whether humans are part of it, but notice it's right out there on the outside of his web. He's not all that sure about that. So we have more conversations to have there. The integrity of the 2020 election, well, he thinks the, it was damaged by media, social and mainstream. Uh, he's on the fence about whether he believes the outcome or not. Uh, in terms of systemic racism, well, first of all, critical race theory, he would say is harmful, this term which is thrown around a lot. But it's not nearly the problem in today's society as many opportunists would have you believe. He doesn't buy the way in which this has gotten so much attention in current climate. And I hope I'm being fair to Wilk here. I would want to be. He might be watching this. <laughs> so Wilk, I got it. I, I think I understand this. So OK, is it hopeless then <laughs> for this guy and me? We are just a little snapshot here in the area of public health and a few other things about why we're so divided. Can we find common ground? Well, our webs are very different. But they can't just float free in the air. I'm about to hit you with another visual metaphor here. <laughs> They have to be anchored to something, right? And we both agree there's way too much hate. Wilk actually runs a podcast called Derate the Hate. I will be his uh, guest on Thursday evening. We'll see how that goes. So yeah, there's something here. So now with much credit uh, to a different grandchild than the one who's here tonight, I have another granddaughter who's an artist. Let's look at this. There's something underneath the webs. It's called values. Values of things like truth, beauty, goodness, freedom, faith, family, and love. If I ask Wilk, do you believe in those? Absolutely. Do I believe in those? Absolutely. But they're another layer down. Proverbs actually has this wonderful verse Wisdom has built her house. She has set it up at seven pillars. They never tell you what the seven pillars are. I'm not suggesting that I have the answer, but it is intriguing that you have this little window into that kind of, men, uh, kind of thinking. So our webs are attached to those. We still have those values. We still want to do the right thing. We still believe in love and goodness and beauty and faith and family. And yet my web... And Wilkes Webb might look very different if we could figure out how to get beyond the intense arguments about those things in the web that are based upon trust, based upon different interpretations of social experiences, and back down to the foundations of these pillars of values, then we might have some hope. So to finish, how then do we take this kind of analysis and find hope in dark times. I'm not going to give you easy answers, and I hope we can have a good conversation about other ideas you might have. We do still share those pillars as universal values. Many people of faith sense that something is deeply wrong. Did you see David French's column a, month, uh, a week or so ago where he said, we don't have two Americas. It's not just red and blue. There's a third one. It's called exhausted. Do you resonate with that? <laughs> that you have these intensely passionate people who are on the red and the blue side, and then a lot of America is like, oh, I'm just trying to leave my life, and things aren't going very well, and could we please start to have a reasonable conversation? Well, maybe, maybe those people of faith of that sort who sense that something is wrong are in a position to actually start to do something about it. Reclaim the foundations. Return to what faith is all about, truth, love. And it's got to start with each of us. I don't see some grand sweeping approach here. One of the things I've wondered about, should we all make a pledge? Imagine this. Make a pledge that you will not distribute information on social media unless you know absolutely that it's true. Think what would happen if everybody decided today to make that pledge. Reach out to the other side. Find people who you know or absolutely in a different place than you are, and invite them for a drink or a dinner, and really have a civil discourse about that and try to understand each other. Find those pillars. I know they're there. 
Trinity Forum is in a very important place, like tonight, to try to bring that kind of conversation together. So is BioLogos. Maybe they could be part of some kind of a coalition of like-minded groups. There's a lot of groups out there, including people of faith, who just sense we gotta do something here. We're going the wrong way in our whole society. How can we do this? And remember, just the status quo, not what you want. As Winston Churchill says, if you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> it's not a place to just stop and look around. <clears throat> But again, as people of faith, let us all agree, this is a time for urgent prayer and reflection. But not just that, also for action. My favorite quote from the Oxford poet, Peter Levi, about this is, what is hope anyway? Hope in every sphere of life is a privilege, a privilege that attaches to action. No action, no hope. OK, we got an opportunity for action, because we sure need hope. Thank you all very much. Francis, thank you for that. That was fascinating. And there's so much I could ask. But I will try to keep this relatively short just so we have plenty of time for audience questions. Uh, but one of the, the many things that struck me and um, in a way is quite unsettling, you talked about the different ways that we make up our minds. And yeah. um, David Hume and reason being a slave to the passions. And of course, you mentioned Jonathan Haidt and the righteous mind. And part of Haidt's argument is that we may think that we try to make decisions based on logic and careful research and uh, you know, analysis of the facts, uh, but really our mind is much more like a press secretary serving what we actually want. <laughs> and, and then when you sort of combine that with what you talked about uh, misinformation and the fact that misinformation spreads so much more quickly than that which is accurate on social media. And I guess I would love to kind of hear your thoughts about why is it that we crave misinformation mm. and self-deception? And what has gone on in our own Christian catechesis that there's not a substantial difference in the way we approach that? Great questions, uh, Cherie. So yeah, Jonathan Haidt also has this metaphor of the boy riding the elephant. And we all think we're the rider, our rational character, figuring out exactly what's happening. But the elephant, uh, which is all of our passions, is actually deciding exactly what's going to happen next. And we're deluding ourselves to think we're in charge. Mm -hmm. I, again, I didn't want that to be so obvious, but it certainly seems uh, like it's mm -hmm. the way my brain works once I'm honest about it. Why do we do this? We are all seeking sort of a place uh, where we feel stable, reassured, comforted, that we are actually somewhat in control of our lives, of our environment, of our relationships. And so we arrive at this framework, which I guess I'm trying to picture as this web of beliefs, that makes us feel at ease, that we kind of got it figured out. And it's very threatening uh, to hear that some part of that, especially really central parts of that, aren't true. Now, you can revise your web of belief. If I'd shown you my web of belief when I was 23, it would have been that of an atheist. It would have been profoundly different. So my web had to be completely torn up and reconstructed by this very difficult, wrenching, but ultimately joyful transition into becoming a follower of Jesus. But it did not happen without a great deal of difficulty and, and wrenching sort of self-examination and fear of what it might mean. There's a lot of fear associated with really reinventing uh, your web of belief because you don't quite know who you are or where you're going to be. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're also asking is, shouldn't all of this be guided more than it seems to be right now by other foundations, particularly for us as people of faith, by what we know from the teachings of the Bible and especially the teachings of Jesus about what is true and honorable, that it's not about selfishness, it's not about anger, it's loving your neighbor, it's loving your enemies especially. 
oh, are we practicing that? That's why I put up this question about is our catechesis, which is a fancy word of saying, is our sort of religious foundation formation, our spiritual formation, showing its real weakness now at a time where we are all under a lot of duress. And this ought to be the moment where our faith gives us the strongest support, and yet maybe it's not as strong as we want it to be, and we fall into other traps. Mm -hmm. I, I fear that's one of the conclusions I have to draw. And that's about me, too. I'm not trying to throw stones at everybody else. Mm -hmm. I think my own catechesis needs some work. You know, I also wanted to talk or ask you about error, credibility, and certainty. And there, there, you could take this in a bunch of different directions. There's a lot I'll kind of wrap up into this one question, because, of course, we'd love to talk with you for hours. But uh, one of the things that struck me that you likely faced in the job is the tension uh, between the full picture and the imperative to deliver a clear, uh, followable message. Um, and you know, we, most people crave clarity, mm. simplicity, and certainty. And that helps add up to trust. Uh, in any new pandemic, there's going to be things one discovers. And my understanding of science itself is that there is a common refrain that around half of what we think we know is wrong. We just don't know which half. Right. Uh, so how, uh, when one is in a position of public trust, where errors can be fatal, does one manage those competing tensions of the full truth with an understandable clarity? Yeah. Sheree, I think all of us engaged in public health communication during the pandemic uh, probably failed uh, in this need to explain uh, the nature of the science of COVID-19, that it was an evolving process. There was such a hunger uh, to get very clear, here's what you need to do, and I know it's right, that we often presented things in that way. I did that myself. And every one of those messages should have been, this is the best I can do right now uh, with the information I've got, but it's probably gonna change because we're early in this pandemic and this virus might even change. And oh my God, it did. <laughs> and there's a lot of data that is still sketchy and not quite yet peer reviewed. And so right now today, this is the corpus of evidence I've got in front of me. I'm gonna give you my best recommendation, but it might be wrong. And if it is, I hope I'll find out and then I'll tell you. We didn't do that. It was sort of like, okay, today you should do this. End of, end of presentation. And we made, a, I think, a really unfortunate mistake there that then caused people to begin to lose confidence in the scientific information because it did change. And people began to think, wait, they're just playing around with me. Uh, what is this whipsawing? They don't know what they're talking about. And in fact, I would say every one of the public health pronouncements that came from a Rochelle Walensky or a Tony Fauci or sometimes from me were the best we could do that day. And if it had to change, it's because the data changed but people didn't really get a chance to understand that was the nature of the process. And yeah. that's a really important lesson that we have learned from this, and I wish we had done a better job of. Yeah. You know, you'd also mentioned the role that fear and anger played oh, yeah. in our uh, perceptions or misperceptions. And it does seem that fear and anger certainly fuels a lot of conspiracy theories. You know, it's, um, it's one thing to have a distrust of vaccines. I'm not quite sure how you get to microchips, you know, without fear and anger being involved. And, and what, um, you know, both as a scientist and, um, <laughs> and as a Christian, what do you see as driving a lot of the fear and anger behind our, con our conspiracy mindedness and our confusion? Well, let's be clear. It's a very stressful period we're going through. The worst pandemic in more than a century. A million people plus have died, probably quite a few more than that that we even know. Probably something like 20 million people worldwide. We haven't seen anything like this in 100 years. Uh, that has got to put everybody totally on edge and fearful of what's coming next and what's going to happen to me and what's going to happen to my family. So that sort of sets up a circumstance or anything that sounds like it's not being done right is going to really rile you up, and it has. So I think on top of that, um, the whole nature of the way in which we have separated ourselves into tribes, uh, oftentimes driven by messages that seemed comforting if you were in the tribe, 
whether or not those messages were firmly based on, on truth and reality, then it became very hard uh, to suggest that that was not the answer. And if somebody came after one of those claims, then it made you angry. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we all know social media has been a brilliant uh, exploiter of that kind of response, where a message that's gonna make people angry is gonna get a lot of likes and a lot of advertising. And I don't quite know how we're gonna get past that beyond this hope that we will all take some more responsibility for not sharing information that might not be true. But we're a long way from that now. So it all kind of feeds into this uncircum unfortunate circumstance. Maybe the best antidote is for people to say, wait a minute, I'm not a person of anger and fear. I'm a person who trusts in God, who has sense that God is about love and trust and truth. And I'm not going to participate in this kind of whipping up of those responses that may be based upon somebody's effort to sell something. But we don't have enough of that uh, to be able to anywhere near stem the tide. And I, I worry that we are at the present time not seeing a whole lot of evidence that this is getting better. You know, I also wanted to ask you about what you talked about a bit as an an uh, antidote, which is, you know, to pursue the truth in love. And I, I know you're a big fan of C.S. Lewis. Oh, and yeah. one of the ways that he described his group, the Inklings, was a group of people who were united by a love, but felt felt and thought very differently about just about everything else. And he talked about their gatherings as they would go at it, hammer and tongs, late into the night. <laughs> and he said, but we fought for truth. They didn't fight for domination you know, or for a victory over the other, but for truth. And I know that you are in a book club where uh, you, do a, you engage in similar kinds of activities. Yeah. And I'd love for you just to kind of share, um, as both a man of science uh, and a man of faith in the different contexts you have been in, what does it look like to pursue truth and love in our different spheres? Well, it's... It's hard to do, but it's worth every bit of it. You know, um, Lewis and Tolkien didn't always agree about the value of this or that person's book. By the way, Tolkien always uh, kind of said he thought Lewis's efforts in the Space Trilogy uh, were very second rate <laughs> compared to things like The Lord of the Rings. So, but they, they knew that, <laughs> had, a, had a pretty good comparison there, I guess. Uh, but they knew the difference between opinion <clears throat> and truth. And by the way, you know, truth, <clears throat> we have to think about the gradations of truth. It's not like, okay, this category is absolutely objectively true and everything else is not. There's sort of a gray area in between. I mean, the earth is round. That's true. And the earth goes around the sun, not the other way around. That's true. <laughs> um, when it comes to things like, okay, um, my opinion about the value of a particular medical therapy uh, for diabetes, I can look at the data and I can say, I think this is true, but it might change in the next research study that comes up with a different answer. So we all agree that that is an unresolved issue. Um, either Jesus Christ lived, died, and was resurrected, either that is completely true, or there's no point in my faith. Um, so that is a category of truth I have to basically consider, not as a subject of gray uncertainty. <laughs> Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart, although I'm fine with having doubts, and like all Christians, I do. At the same time, if it's not true, then I need to do something different with my life. <laughs> but, of course, when it comes to many of the things that we disagree about, those things in the web of belief, they're more in the gray area, I suppose, than they are in the absolute yes or no. They're not mathematics. <laughs> They're more along the lines of opinion. In our book club, uh, I am fortunate uh, to mostly listen <laughs> to some amazing uh, intellects, uh, one of whom is here in the room, Pete Weiner. Um, and we read books that are quite challenging and discuss, oftentimes uh, inviting the author to come and, and join us. Uh, what they were trying to say. And we disagree, uh, but always in a civil way that elevates everybody's understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm grateful for that. 
Um, Tim Keller, who's also a regular member of the book club, and I have not come to terms about Adam and Eve. We're still trying to work on that one in <laughs> terms of exactly mm -hmm. what was the intention there uh, of those particular verses and what does that say about uh, their ancestry of the entire human population. And that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. We will continue to have that conversation. And uh, I hope some of the other book club people are on my side. But, <laughs> but we should do more of that. We should be not afraid to wander into arenas uh, where there's a lot of disagreement. I mean, that's what I'm doing with Braver Angels. Mm -hmm. I should have said, the one thing that with these Braver Angel conversations, and it's not just me and Wilk, it's lots of other people engaged in this, the time where everything suddenly stops being so tense is when the moderator says to each, you know, okay, we've all expressed our opinion here. Can you name a few mistakes that you've made? Isn't that interesting? And I have no trouble because <laughs> I've made plenty. And everybody else gets there too. And everything changes at that moment. This idea of being given a chance uh, for some humility. <laughs> we don't have a lot of humility in a lot of our conversations right now. Uh, they're just all very dug in and very angry. Put that aside and say, OK, what mistake did I made? Let me talk to you about that. And the other person feels safe doing the same. And it's a totally different conversation. It's a great antidote. That's fascinating. So we're going to turn it over to questions from the audience. And those of you who have been to Trinity Forum events before know that we have three guidelines that we ask for all questions. We ask that all questions be brief and one part. Uh, all questions be civil, and all questions be in the form of a question. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, Amelia and Brian with mics. Please wait until the mic actually arrives to you before asking your question. So we'll open the floor now. Questions from the audience. I have a couple of questions right. over here, so we'll start Great. here. Okay. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Collins. So, um, I want to know what's the science around the, the question. I know the Pope weighed in on this a bit about uh, uh, fetuses being used for the vaccine development in terms of like uh, embryos. What's, what's the thinking on that from an ethics standpoint? Mm -hmm. uh, and then to mm -hmm. what extent does the data show that there is robust protection through natural immunity? And do you think uh, of those 50 million people who have not received the vaccine, how much of, you know, how many of those are because of, you know, they're thinking, oh, I have natural immunity. Yeah. Good questions. So in terms of the use of fetal cell lines in the production of COVID vaccines, that is obviously something of concern uh, to people of faith because those cell lines were derived from an elective termination of pregnancies in Scandinavia in the 1970s that then was put into cell culture, which has been growing in the laboratory for many decades. Uh, a particular couple of those cell lines are often used as a means of preparing various biologics. And in fact, there's a lot of other drugs that have had that process utilized. But for people who were really opposed uh, to the idea of this kind of use of material, this presented a, a challenge. Um, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines were not prepared uh, in those cell lines. There was a testing to see if they worked in a particular lab experiment where one of those cell lines was used for the test, but the vaccine itself never passed through uh, those lines. The J&J &J vaccine did because it was a different type in an adenovirus that needed to be grown in that space. The new vaccine, the Novavax, um, it never had any contact uh, with the fetal cell lines, and that may be a source of reassurance to some people who are still troubled about this, even though I think Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine were considered uh, to be essentially not uh, a serious issue. The Pope um, very much wrote about this, arguing that Catholics should feel comfortable using any of these vaccines, given the distance between when the termination happened and the use of these cell lines decades later and the benefits that could accrue from the vaccination. So that was one statement that I think got noticed. In terms of your second question, although you were only supposed to ask one, but I'll answer it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, a natural immunity for people who get infected with COVID does provide you with some protection, but we have very strong data that even if you've had natural infection, getting the vaccine on top of that 
greatly elevates uh, your protection. So even people who were sure they had it would be benefited by going ahead and getting the vaccine and the boosters, just like my, I've now had two vaccine doses and two boosters, and when I get a chance for another booster this fall that includes Omicron BA5, I'm gonna take that one too, just constantly trying to keep your immune system ready. Natural infection can be part of that, but it doesn't compensate uh, for all of the other things that you might encounter, and there's lots of people who've had natural infection several times, and some, including some instances where they got quite sick. Right back here, Dr. Collins, thank you for all, all that you did uh, in very difficult times. A uh, question for you. I know you are a person of faith, but I know that some of your colleagues are not necessarily don't really sure that. Were there ever clashes when you talked about religion politics? Like with, okay. I, I know Dr. Fauci, for example, has said that he is, is I think he has called himself a lapsed Catholic or something like that. Or, or so. any, any behind the scenes stuff about clash? Questions? If, you know, there not, any? not really so much. Um, uh, many people have asked me that. I mean, I've been pretty vocal and, and public about my faith ever since I became a believer, and especially since I wrote that book called The Language of God. There was this moment when Obama nominated me to be the NIH director where there was an op-ed in the New York Times uh, that said this was a really dangerous uh, selection for the president to make because this is a guy who seems to believe in a miracle, uh, namely the resurrection of Jesus. So you can't possibly trust him uh, to oversee science uh, because he's obviously not a rigorous thinker. I don't think that had a lot of traction. There were probably some people a little nervous about <laughs> what was gonna happen. It hasn't come up a lot. You know, when it comes to ethical issues, people of faith and people who are not of faith oftentimes come down to the same place because our whole ethical framework is basically built on Judeo-Christian principles, whether the ethicists realize it or not. We all believe in benevolence and non-maleficence and autonomy and justice and equity, don't we? Well, you find those written through all the books of the Bible, but it's also the foundation of what modern bioethics is all about. So we can tend to get along pretty well. Let me piggyback off of that. And I have several friends who are scientists and mathematicians. Uh, some are believers. I would say none of them are atheists. They're agnostics. Mm -hmm. And like uh, the singer James Taylor said, they're almost envious agnostics. They wish they could believe. They can't disprove God, but they, they can't prove him either. How do you help other scientists and mathematicians, academics, make that leap of faith? How, how do you... Uh, how do you uh, mentor them or talk about your faith to bring them along? Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, this is up to the individual. Uh, nobody can bring you there unless you've traveled that road yourself. And I've certainly encountered people who see uh, persons of faith and wonder uh, how that could be true of them and maybe even sort of long for it. A uh, particular person, I won't mention the name, who, who is uh, very incredibly articulate about many things about faith just says, it's like I'm colorblind. Like all of you are seeing these colors and I'm colorblind, I can't see it and I wish I could. And I don't wanna ask that person to anyway compromise their own sense of what they believe. But I do think, and I wrote about this in, in the language of God, that even from science, there's some pretty interesting pointers that can't be ignored. Nobody's gonna give you proof. So if the scientist or the mathematician says, well, you know, if you just give me proof of God's existence, then I'm there. I don't think you're going to be able to offer that. But you can sure, certainly offer the kinds of pointers from science, like the fine-tuning of the universe. If, I recently had a podcast with Richard Dawkins, who is probably one of the more famous uh, new atheists. Uh, you can look it up on the podcast called Unbelievable that Justin Brierley runs. And... and kind of pressed him a little bit. And, and Dawkins would admit that fine-tuning is one of those arguments that really bugs him a little bit. And I almost got him to say he could consider being a deist, uh, but not all the way to being a theist. So those things, I think, do cause people to stop and think. But oftentimes, it's the experience of longing, the experience of beauty that you can't quite put your finger on that gets you past that resistance. And so for people who are in that circumstance, keep chasing those down. <laughs> keep finding what is it that you can't quite understand that seems to be so 
beautiful, so meaningful, what Lewis calls joy, that you can't really understand where it came from, but it seems to be a pointer in your experience to something, something that you long for and it's just a little outside of your grasp. We'll go to Phoebe and then Parker. So Phoebe here on the front row. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. So my question is about, um, you mentioned that you believe that science is true, and I think most of us here do, but can you elaborate between the difference between the scientific method, which naturally is going to go against scientific institutions, which is represented as the truth during the pandemic? Do you see a difference between the scientific method that's always pushing against what the perceived settled science is and the institutions that are saying this is a settled science? Oh yeah, there's a lot of difference for sure. <laughs> First of all, I don't know any scientists who are absolute postmodernists who say there really is no such thing as truth. For science, you have to believe that there is reality, that anybody who's trying to tell you this is all a simulation, sorry, it's not a good way to be a scientist. So you believe that nature has truth written into it, and it is our job as scientists to try to discover that, whether it's about those far-flung galaxies that we saw those beautiful pictures of from James Webb, or whether it's the intricate understanding of how a gene turns on in a particular cell and causes a particular thing to happen, which is what my lab does every day. You believe there is truth there. But you also believe that the scientific method is the best chance we have of uncovering that truth, which is you have a hypothesis, you set up an experiment, you do it rigorously, it has the right controls, you see the result, you do it again and again to be sure that it's reproducible, and then you say, I think I have discovered truth about nature. But you also say, and it might be wrong, because <laughs> it might be something about the way I set this up that was somehow confounded by some other variable that I didn't measure. And you're always prepared to be wrong. And in fact, for a scientist, your greatest joy is when you take something that everybody thought was true and you show it wasn't. <laughs> and then you're, you get invited to all the talks and you win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> So scientists, by their nature, are, are revolutionaries. They, they want to blow everything up and figure out what was, but they do believe there is truth, and they believe it's their job to uncover it. Institutions, well, depending on what institution you're talking about and what their agenda is, is it a pharmaceutical company? Is it a public health institution that believes their mission is to try to spread the word about what we know about a pandemic? They're going to take the science that you've got there and maybe they will have a little bit of a spin on it because of what their own mission is. I would hope that's not true for something like public health, but sometimes it probably creeps in there. And we all have to kind of recognize that that's the case. But should not in that situation start to blame science for that or the scientific method for that. It's how we humans take the output of that and decide how to put it forward. Parker. Thank you. Dr. Collins, um, I speak to you as a person who has profound respect for your Christian commitment and your Christian witness. And I also am very grateful for all that you've done in terms of the genome theory and, and DNA and your wonderful discoveries. Uh, in in uh, 2020, when you were trying to address this whole issue of the pandemic, and it was a it was a, obviously a very early time when there was much we had to learn. Uh, you've, you've always been very clear about science as being an inquiry that it has to be open and open to various theories and, and requires a bit of humility because we're constantly searching for the truth that is, that is constantly coming to us in various ways as we, as we discover the evidence before us. So in the 2020s, when a group of scientists came forward with the Barrington Declaration, they didn't question the issue of vaccines or the importance of vaccines. In fact, what they called for was what they call focus protection. And, but they did call upon a real question about shutting down the economy or closing our schools. Your response on October 8 in 2020 
appeared to utterly reject what they were offering without really substantial debate. And then you demeaned those persons as fringe epidemiologists. As you look back on that now, and we have lots to learn from the experience that we've had, do you have any second thoughts about your response to the Barrington Declaration, and in particular, to those scientist colleagues that you felt were fringe epidemiologists? Oh, thank you for bringing it up. I'm glad to address that. Have you all ever written an email that you kind of wish you had phrased in another way? <laughs> Uh, that's the October 8th email uh, that my colleague is referring to, uh, which was written at a time where I had considerable concerns about an approach that was being put forward uh, by these three folks in the Great Barrington Declaration. Their thesis was that we need to give up on the idea uh, of physical separations and masks and keeping people out of their businesses and their schools but only apply that to the older people because they're the ones at highest risk. And if you weren't one of those folks at high risk, you're probably gonna do okay if you did get COVID, so let's go about and live our lives the way we have been before this happened. And that had a certain appeal on a superficial level, but if you go through the analysis of what that would mean, how do you actually prevent uh, the people that you're supposedly protecting from this very infectious transmissible virus when there's lots of people walking around spreading it who don't even have any symptoms, surely those older people are gonna interact with somebody younger, and then almost certainly there would end up being lots and lots of people who were infected and potentially would lose their lives. So I felt pretty strongly it was a misguided opinion and a, a model, and it wasn't just me, many. I would say the mainstream of public health experts agreed with this, there were 16 strongly worded uh, opinions about the Great Barrington Declaration that were universally uh, saying this is a really bad idea that is gonna cause many thousands or tens of thousands of deaths. So why did I write that email? It was at that point that that view was gaining a lot of traction at high levels in the administration. It had been presented to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. It had been presented to the President as if this was an approach that many people thought could be actually valuable and, and may, might be the way our country should go. And seeing the counter evidence, uh, which I had seen at that point, I was really alarmed. And so yes, I wrote a poorly worded email, <laughs> uh, which then got um, at, uh, attached uh, to a FOIA request, the, Friends, the Freedom of Information Act, mm -hmm. and ended up being quite an important topic for many people to discuss. I regret uh, the, the words that I used in that situation about fringe epidemiologists. <laughs> These are well-intentioned folks. Their opinion, I think, was fringe compared to the rest uh, of the epidemiology community. But I didn't, I was, it was unfortunate that I uh, resorted uh, to something in terms of name calling. At the same time, I do think what they were proposing would have done great harm, and I won't step back from that. We're gonna take one last question. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for this talk. As, a, as an ordained minister, I'd like to apologize on behalf of white evangelical ministers for not <laughs> having done a better job on this topic. My first pastorate was a church plant in Iowa City where I had uh, three physicists and the head of the infectious diseases department as part of the church. And so I came to a very quick and good understanding of the importance of faith. Mm. My question is, knowing what you know now about the roadblocks that various parts of the evangelical community, which no doubt started with pastors, or at least they didn't do enough to remove the roadblocks, is, are there any discussions happening at the highest levels about, okay, how do we incorporate these people early on in the conversation so that they don't completely derail all of our efforts? Mm. Well, we have a lot of lessons to learn, uh, that is for sure, about how science communication played out and how to do a better job of being inclusive 
of everybody's perspective so that they don't feel marginalized and therefore uh, carry on uh, other kinds of channels that turn out not to be uh, what we need. Um, I think we have, all of us who've been involved in this, uh, recognize the need for a new approach uh, if we, God help us, face another pandemic or some other crisis. Or let's talk about climate change. Uh, we, have a cli we have a crisis of another sort that's facing our planet, and we're in the same place in terms of divisiveness and disagreements about what you can accept as true uh, based on the data that's there. And it's going to hurt us desperately if we don't come forward and figure that out. And people of faith ought to care about creation, ought to care about God's gift to all of us in a special way. BioLogos is now stepping into this space more on creation care, uh, which I, I very much welcome. I, I think you're a pastor. I, I think we have not done a great job, perhaps, uh, in terms of getting science information in front of pastors in a way that would have empowered uh, people like yourself uh, to be ready to take on these issues. I've had lots of conversations with pastors in the last two and a half years. I've done podcasts with Rick Warren and Franklin Graham and, and, and Walter Kim and uh, goodness, Tom Wright and Tim Keller. And I get the sense that a lot of pastors are just really worried about bringing this stuff up. <laughs> They've got enough troubles in their church uh, with tensions and angers and divisiveness. And for somebody from the pulpit to start to talk about vaccines is a sure way uh, to result in a lot of people heading for the door. And I, I get that. But yet, our churches ought to be the place where we can talk about these things, about love and truth and life savings. And that hasn't been possible because it is so tense. Somehow, and maybe I need to learn more from people like you, we got to come up with a better way uh, to provide that kind of support uh, for church leaders so that you don't feel you're out there all alone uh, waiting for people to attack whatever you just said without feeling like you've got the foundation behind you. Because uh, that's going to be a critical part uh, of how we get to the truth eventually. So yeah, a lot of lessons to learn here. I'm glad you brought this up. The other thing before we close, I, I must say, I hope we can also work not just on Christian catechesis, but on science <laughs> catechesis of Christians. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think we still are in a place where a lot of people, we're not in a great place to evaluate the science of COVID-19 or of, or of uh, climate change, to be able to say, okay, what are the facts here? Let me judge them for myself. Um, and a lot of Christians, of course, have been raised in homes where science wasn't necessarily seen as your friend. Mm -hmm maybe even as something to be a little fearful of because it might be undercutting what your faith was telling you about things like human origins. And if we can do a better job with the next generation of preparing them to see that science and faith are both uh, really insights that we get from God, that we have this wonderful phrase of Francis Bacon, the two books, the book of nature, and the, which is uh, uh, obviously the book of God's works but also the book of the Bible, which is the book of God's words. And they can't very well be in conflict. They're both God's books. I love that concept. And yet it's still not easy for a lot of people to see those as simultaneously and equally trustworthy. Uh, Biologos, uh, one more advertisement here, has a <laughs> wonderful new series of science curricular supplements uh, for Christian homeschoolers and Christian high schools called Integrate which provides for uh, those curricula, which unfortunately oftentimes are not up to speed in terms of what we know in science about origins with the kind of information that a very serious Christian could embrace and see as another indication of God's grace and awesome creation. And more of that would be a good thing too. Francis, thank you. This has been fascinating. <laughs>